That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Marlowe, the 19th film directed by Neil Jordan, which is being released February 15th, 2023, courtesy of Open Road Films. Notably, it premiered at the 2022 San Sebastian Film Festival. This director, I know several of their films. Several, many. Yeah, Neil Jordan is a big deal. I've been very excited for this film for a while because it's Neil Jordan and... Uh, you read the book. And it's... Return of Jessica Lange, yeah. Uh, you Well, you haven't seen The Crying Game, which is, you know, the the iconic masterpiece in his oeuvre, but he also did uh, the 1994 version of Interview with the Vampire. Uh, Breakfast on Pluto is a favorite. Uh his last film was Greta, starring Isabelle Huppert, which I, I know is like a campy B film, but I had a really good time with that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So many... The Good Thief with Nick Nolte I remember really liking. I thought this movie was okay. It's beautifully shot. The cinematography is exquisite. It differs from the book it's based on heavily, which you'll talk to t talk about later. Well, before we even get into the book, this is the 11th iteration of the character oh. Philip Marlowe on screen. Okay. And of course, Philip Marlowe is the signature character written by Raymond Chandler in a, a variety of very iconic, you know, what have came to be referred to as film noir novels. Uh, and many directors have, you know, examined him. This is a piece of fan fiction, kind of, written by uh, Neil Jordan's Irish. There's an Irish writer, John Manville, who has, or Banville, who has a uh, series of his own mystery novels, but he was wrote under a pseudonym, Benjamin Black, a novel called The Black-Eyed Blonde in 2014, which was an unused title by Chandler himself. And that's where this came from. The basic story, 1939, Los Angeles. Liam Neeson is a detective. Marlowe. Philip Marlowe. Mm -hmm. Okay, one day Diane Kruger comes in and hires him to look for some guy named Nico, mm -hmm. who's like an ex-lover of hers. So Liam goes looking. And then he gets in contact with Jessica Lange, who is Diane Kruger's mother. Mm -hmm. And she also wants to, him to find Nico. And we find out that Nico was hired... So this... D Diane Kruger is kind of playing a game because she has employed Nico to find evidence of, like, the, the the film studio run by this guy called The Ambassador. They're also involved in, like, drug running. Mm -hmm. So Diane Kruger has hired Nico to f find proof of that. But really the game is... She's really trying to secure this proof so she can get in the good graces of the ambassador who ultimately gives Diane Kruger control of the film studio he runs. That once was the bread and butter of Jessica Lange th as the mother as an actress decades prior. And then Jessica Lange, she's super rich, always wanted to be an actress, but that really didn't pop off. So now that Diane Kruger runs the film studio, Jessica Lange is in pictures. The end. I mean, that's basically it. Basically, <laughs> yes. Which differs differs Heavily quite, from quite a bit from the book. Uh, in, in ways that I think William Monaghan, who is a director himself, he directed Mojave, uh, but also scripted The Departed, which is a remake for Scorsese, uh, I, I think does a lot of more interesting things with what the book was trying to do. But ultimately, I don't know that it's interesting enough uh, to make this not seem more like just a nostalgic slice of fan fiction. This film felt to me like someone wanted to make a movie about this era in the film noir style. Mm -hmm. So it's like um, a lot of style, but not a lot of... Because there are more interesting characters. So should I go through those? So Alan Cumming... Mm -hmm. Who's a character from the book, Lou Hendricks. Who plays like... He has like a southern accent, which I think he did an incredible job with. Um, he is also looking for Nico. Mm -hmm. Then Alan Cumming has a driver. Cedric. Cedric. Who's that? The actor's name I know is difficult to pronounce, but we're uh, going to try. Adewale Akinoye Agbaje, who you've seen in things, including the first Suicide Squad film. He's the lizard crocodile man in that. Okay. I'm just going to get to what I think the better story would have been. I feel like this movie should have been about Jessica Lange and Alan Cumming and them sort of like 
Because they're a lot of fun. Jessica Lange is so much fun. I mean, she's the best part of the film to yes. me. And I think this is her first film since uh, that Wild Oats movie in 2016. I think it would have been so much fun to see Jessica Lange as like this glamorous, rich woman who's bitter towards Hollywood, but kind of like can do whatever she wants against Alan Cummings' character, who's like this queen who's into some other stuff. And they're at odds trying to like get at someone. And then Cedric, the driver, I also really like that character. Mm -hmm. Because he's kind of in the background and he's mistreated. Uh, he's spoken to in a very disrespectful way because he's black. And in the end, I kind of wanted him to end up... Like, the gag is that he ends up gaining control of the film studio, let's say. Well, a scene that I do like is when Marlo kind of hands this... To he has this shot off, shot off shotgun and uh, Cedric has this Tommy gun and they just kind of decimate the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, Cedric gets an opportunity... Because Alan Cumming, his boss, mistreats him. So there is a moment when Cedric gets to kill Alan Cumming. But in the end of this film... Liam Neeson goes to visit Diane Kruger now that she's head of the film studio and she's like, I have a job for you. I want to make you like executive of security basically because you know all of our secrets. So I want to basically give you a pension and make sure you're happy so you don't tell our secrets. And Liam's like, I'm not interested in this job, but I know someone who'd be great at it who also knows your secrets and that would be the black driver, Cedric. Mm -hmm. So the end of the film is Liam telling Cedric, like, I can get you this job with my recommendation. And then he gives him um, the gun that Diane Kruger used. Who? To kill Nico. Francois Arnault. So it's kind of like insurance that Cedric will always, you know, have a Be job. Fine. And I really liked that. But I just thought, oh, I liked Diane Kr or Jessica Lange, Alan Cumming, and the actor playing Cedric were so good that I wish the movie would have revolved around them. But I, I do like Danny Houston, who is the who runs this club that is basically this high end, um, this exclusive club where all these rich people go. But it's actually a brothel, like drug haven, because in the bowels of it, there are all these kind of weird sex things happening, and people are doing a lot of drugs, which was really interesting. Because Nico's sister, who they refer to as a cabana whore, <laughs> uh, who gets killed by these two. Prominent, but not very prominent Mexican characters that uh, have crossed the border to also retrieve Nico, who has these, who also was drug running, worked in the film industry, uh, and also has uh, these very detailed records of this film studio buying these drugs. You could pl you could play a game or count the number of times someone in this movie refers to. It's a lot. But you said in the book... In the book, those two characters are there. They do kill Nico's sister quite violently and then themselves are dispatched in a similar manner. So when Liam... I, I think Liam's fine. Liam's fine. This is also being touted as his hundredth feature film. <laughs> and it's better than these B-grade action films would have you suggest. But I think he's too old to play Marlo. Because even reading Marlo in the book, he just doesn't read that old because... in. In the novel with Diane Kruger's Claire Cavendish, they ha he falls head over heels and they have a very sexual affair, which she's also using to manipulate him, which they avoid, I and think, yeah. it, which is fine. Notably, um, Jessica Lange and Liam Neeson were lovers in the film Rob Roy in the 90s. Mm. And as a kid, I remember a very violent rape scene with Jessica Lange by Tim Roth. Anyhow, and Neil Jordan previously directed Liam Neeson and Michael Collins. Kruger was recently was with Neeson in the film Unknown, I think. Um, again, he's not the best Marlowe. He's also not the worst. The worst, I think, is James Garner in the 1969 film that's also called, called Marlowe. Oh. Well, I thought an amusing scene was when Liam first goes looking for Nico, he goes to the house and the neighbor who reminded me of the neighbor in uh, Home Improvement. Mm -hmm. Immediately, Liam is there and the neighbor sees him. He's like, oh, you looking for Nico? And he tells all his business. And he's got chickens. I, I thought that was amusing. Another, uh, another game you could play is the number of times someone lights a cigarette in this movie. There is a lot of that. Boy. Uh, Danny Houston has a good line. Because Nico... Claire hires Marlo and she's like, look for Nico. And then he's like, Right away, he finds out that Nico Peterson was killed in this this drive-by outside of this club where his head was literally smashed in. And she already knew that part of it, which is immediately frustrating. Like, why didn't you tell me that? But so he's interviewing Danny Houston a few times, who know because he's the one that doesn't want Nico found, right? Because he's had a, a hand in staging this death. But he says, I don't think I've ever seen a sober driver. I wrote that down. I don't think I've ever seen a sober driver. <laughs> what? Um, yeah. 
you know, I also thought Danny Houston was fun. Mm-hmm. But but again, it's like, so now you have four characters who I thought were a lot of fun mm-hmm. in the style of like... That that style of, you know, my, one of my favorite Marlowe's is um, Dick Powell in Murder, My Sweet. And an, an older Marlowe is fine because Robert Mitchum is technically much older when he's in the 70s remake of that, Farewell, My Lovely, which is the name of the book, uh, which Charlotte Rampling's also in. And it that the scenes with Danny Houston really do have that vibe and Jessica Lange. Did we mention, you know, she's this faded star. It's 1939. How many decades ago was she in film? And what did they... Like, she would have been, like, a silent Was she a silent actor? film star? I, um, but, yeah, I like my... In these types of movies, I like more hammy performances. And I think Liam is just fine. He's just kind of there, well, moving around. I, want the, I wanted that hard-boiled quality that those classic film yeah. noirs have, which I think you can still do, even in color. Uh, well, Alan Cummings giving it. Alan Cummings with that a lot of southern fun. accent that you said reminded you of Frank Underwood. Yeah, he's giving which me... Which I agreed with. He's giving me House of Cards there. Uh, I think that um, Cole Meany shows up as uh, the cop that is very friendly with Neeson that's helping him kind of on the inside as well. Um, I think that would have been the Stephen Ray character because I've never seen... I. I I needed to double check this, but I don't think there's previously a Neil Jordan film that hasn't featured Stephen Ray, who mm-hmm. starred in his uh, debut Angel, and I, I think he's even in Mona Lisa with Bob Hoskins. I, I yeah, I, could, I, I think it's curious that he's not in this film. Could you explain how the movie differs from the book? Well, as I said, the Claire Cavendish and the uh, Marlowe have this a love romance. Of, a romance, this love affair that's not in the movie. And there are these all these multiple people that are characters in the book. But it comes down to... And the Jessica Lange character... That's one thing I like that Monaghan did with the script. He really brings out her. And it's this weird mother-daughter thing that Marlowe's stuck in the middle of. And I like that a lot. Because Jessica Lange's character, Dorothy... In this one, is named Dorothy King Cannon. She's just this old, doddering woman who's really out of it. In the book. And has holds the purse strings, right? Um, Also, the difference is... Claire wants to find Nico, not because they were ex-lovers, but... It's in relation to something that happened outside of the novel with an old uh, cohort of Marlowe's who he helps cover up a murder who has gotten away in Mexico is, is the short end version of that. And it just obviously it's just not as interesting. Uh, but however, I think I must have said it 15 times watching this film last night that the cinematography is beautiful. Everybody looks great in this like yellow glow that's going on. There's these there's these. Uh, um, underground club scenes that we just get the bare snippets of but I really like uh, even this destruction of this uh, aquarium that's there's also these McGuffin these MacGuffins in there right they even uh, give direct reference to the Maltese Falcon which is a Dashiell Hammett not a Chandler Uh, because Nico was drug running and so he's brought back all these drugs from over the border and one of them is this in this bust of a mermaid in an aquarium that's named Serafina or the, mm. that's who Danny Houston thinks he's looking for I believe uh, but uh, Xavi Jimenez who's worked with Brad Anderson as the cinematographer he shot The Machinist and Trans-Siberian, Trans-Siberian I think but it looks really good I would recommend watching it just because of how beautiful it is and if you're a Jessica Lange fan because and then she's fun um, but, but yeah I don't know that I needed a Liam Neeson to be Marlowe I understand based on all the things behind the scenes why this came together but I, I think he's better served as a, a jaded, cynical man in his mid to late forties. But Marlowe. Marlowe. What would you give this film? Two and a half. I would give it two and a half out of five. It was fine. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>